It isn't all lollipops and daisy chains in Watchland, you know, and so today I'm going to be doing a little housekeeping and cleaning out those watch brands that really ought to be doing better. It's about to get stanky up in here. To set the scene, I don't want to simply pull out the most god-awful looking watches I can find, point fingers at them and say, ew. Because me telling you which brands I think make ugly watches isn't going to be particularly productive. You can see that for yourself. Likewise, there are plenty of low volume, unheard of watch brands making mediocre watches that I'd rather not even draw attention to. So these ones are perhaps not going to be all of what you expect, and perhaps not for the reasons you expect either. To show you what I mean, let's start off with the first brand, Breguet. Now, Breguet has a remarkable legacy. Abraham Louis of the same name was such a legend in watchmaking that John Arnold, the man who coined the term chronometer, swapped sons with him. Not permanently, just for an apprenticeship, but you get the point. When the guy, the man, John Arnold, sends his son to you to learn watchmaking, it means you're pretty good at it. It's like James Corden shipping out his spawn to learn how to be unbearably annoying. Breguet had more hits than the Beatles. He invented the first shock absorption to protect delicate pivots from breaking. He was neck and neck with Perillet for the first self-winding watch. The overcoil, which brought concentricity to the expansion and contraction of the balance spring, was his. The first wristwatch ever for crying out loud. And of course, the tourbillon. Man's a legend. He is said to have spiked one of his watches into the floor at a well-to-do dinner party just to prove the shock absorption worked. And the watches of Breguet today are, in a word, exquisite. The complexity, the finishing, the artisanship, all peerless, doesn't really sound all too bad. And yet, for some reason, Breguet has slipped into a state of lifelessness to the point where people are wondering if the brands only hit in a decade will be made of bioceramic. If Breguet, the brand, could talk, it would say, I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it anymore, and what's it seems weird and scary. Seeing Breguet flounder feels like browsing a nudie mag in a church. It's just wrong. Five, ten years ago, they were a top ten best-selling brand, sharing rarefied air with the likes of Patek Philippe and Vacheron Constantin. Now they aren't even in the top twenty. If anything, you'll find them in the airport lounge alongside Tissot and Hamilton. All the ingredients are there, but they just aren't compounded into a brand that inspires people. It's less an active contributor to the industry and more… more of a mausoleum for a once great watchmaker. It would be unfair to talk about Breguet in this way and not bring up Blancpain. Like Breguet, when Blancpain comes up in conversation with watch type people, there's always a moment's silence, an array of sad furrowed brows, and someone usually says something like, it's a real shame what happened. Like we're talking about a kid with a bright promising future that died in a drunk driving accident. Blancpain, to put everything here into perspective, is the oldest watch company in the world. 1735 it was founded, and it has been in action in some guise or another ever since. That's getting on for 300 years ago. When Mr Whitebread first set up shop in Villaray, the British Industrial Revolution hadn't even started yet, nor had the Brits yet got into a spot of bother over tea in the Americas. Captain Cook, never mind sailing the oceans, he was still learning to swim. The company is so old that when Villaret was annexed to France during the Napoleonic Wars, it was already a third generation business. The brand, as you would expect, had its fair share of world firsts, some less well known than others. Here's one of my favourites. Despite Rolex's best efforts to suggest otherwise, British watchmaker John Harwood brought the first self-winding wristwatches to market, with the automatic rotor bolted onto a movement built in partnership with none other than Blancpain. This wouldn't be the last kerfuffle with Rolex, as in 1950-something, one of the two first made a dive watch that would become the dive watch forever and to eternity. Neither seemed to argue over the fact that it was Blancpain, but very clearly Rolex did the better job of actually getting theirs out there. Imagine making the first dive watch and then just sitting on it while someone else has their way. That's like donating a Ferrari Enzo to the shelter for homeless to sleep in. Not even a big kick up the posterior from the watch industry's Dr. Frankenstein, one Jean-Claude Beaver, could get Blancpain back up to full health. Right now, it appears to be in the late Michael Jackson stage of its existence, held together with sticky tape and propofol. Again, there's so much there, such a strong foundation to build on, but no. 
Oh well. Imagine buying into a brand that has a built-in, rabidly dedicated fan base that traces its origins back to perhaps the first military commission for Rolex and has one of the purest and most iconographic designs in watchmaking history, and then doing worse by it than an old lady and her fresco. You had one job, Panerai. One. Don't break it. I don't know if perhaps Mummy and Daddy Panerai went out for a well-needed break away from the kids and left their teenage son in charge. What I do know is that this Project P has been less than ideal. Only this time, it's not Macosta County, Michigan where it all started going wrong, but Brooklyn. New York. In 2011, Panerai released a 150-piece limited edition of its iconic Luminor Marina, but this time with a solid caseback engraved with a depiction of the famous Brooklyn Bridge. It's the PAM 00318, and it's still listed on the Panerai website if you search for it. Look it up. It was a special boutique-only edition containing the caliber OPXX IX. Now, some context. This was an era before the in-house movement became the hype thing. Many, many manufacturers used basic bought-in movements, and really the watchmaker's in-house prowess came from distinguishing finishes applied to the movement. Panerai, to be historically accurate, frequently used the Eta 6497, a big hand-wound movement with a pocket watch lineage. It's a fine movement, and when well decorated, a worthy addition to any watch. Only trouble was, the OPXXIX was not a well decorated movement. To be clear, it wasn't even a decorated movement. The manufacturers of these calibers offer up their wares in different states of decoration, from bare-boned, fresh out of the wash nothing, to exquisitely elaborate graining, beveling and polishing. In the case of the £4,900 318, Panerai chose death. The caliber OPXXIX was nothing short of the most basic iteration of the 6497 possible, with not only less finishing than the 1996 Monaco Grand Prix and edges so raw they'd leave Gordon Ramsay speechless, this thing was flat out beaten and scratched like it had spent the first part of its life as a hockey puck. Lord knows why one of the 150 people who bought one chose to take the cakes back off, but in doing so they uncovered the start of something rotten at Panerai that just hasn't gone away. Today, it's almost like the brand overcompensated by driving towards luxury and sustainability with elaborate in-house movements and everything that didn't get people zealous about the brand in the first place. It's a wicked shame because, whilst the design is not to everyone's tastes, it's a wholly unique and historic thing that stands out completely from everything else on the market. There's nothing contrived or artificial about those original designs, but somehow Panerai has gone on to manage it anyway. I'm oh, sorry, I've just heard the box is recycled. I'll have two, please. Join me, if you will, on the tale of a watchmaker. And not just any ordinary watchmaker, but one so gifted with talent he would have had Simon Cowell booking in another round with his plastic surgeon. He was one of the last of the old guard, a shining example of those master watchmakers who fettled only the finest machinery, cutting his teeth at Longines in the 1950s and quickly rising through the ranks to the Patek Philippe High Complications Workshop. Those watches you see fetching helicopter money at auction, some of those could well have passed through his hands. For the few watchmakers that get that far, which is almost entirely none of them, that's the holy grail. Working for Patek Philippe in the high complications team isn't just like getting a seat in F1, it's like getting the seat, table, crockery and all the silverware too. But genius never settles for settling, and so our plucky hero ditched the big PP to go fix old watches and clocks instead. And by fix old watches and clocks, I mean restoring the finest and rarest examples in the world. He did this for collectors, auction houses and even the brands themselves, and he was the best. He was periscope proof. Still, it wasn't enough. Not content with making the best watches in the world for someone else, or fixing the most important watches in the world either, he decided to make his own brand. There were two main models, one a chronograph and the other, at its most complex, containing a world first that he had developed for Harry Winston. The bi-retrograde, wait for it, perpetual calendar. Now that's just showing off. Everyone knows the perpetual calendar is Patek Philippe's thing, and here's this, doing whatever that is, and it's just outrageous. Rubbing it in their face like that is just poor taste, like fragrantly dancing at a man in a wheelchair. So time to reveal all. Who is this mystery watchmaker? One, Roger Dubuis. Wait, Roger Dubuis as in the Lamborghini tire tread knights of the round table Roger Dubuis? The very same. 
Aligning those two visuals in the mind's eye takes some real mental parkour. I imagine this is what being John Malkovich is like. Especially when you see that those original watches are going for upwards of £60,000. Collectors love them, auctioneers love them, and yet what the brand is actually making couldn't be further from any of that. I haven't met a single person who's heard of Roger Dubuis who doesn't say the same thing. They should be making what they used to make in the way they used to make it. Did you know that famed watch designer Gerald Charles Genta founded his own watch brand? Actually, he founded several. Bored of designing the most iconic watches for Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe, Omega, Cartier, IWC, Bulgari, Hamilton, and so on and so on, he thought he'd let loose and have a crack at sticking his own name on a watch instead. This was the Gerald Genta brand, and he really let loose. Like, mum's been on the Baileys again loose. From the cutesy Mickey Mouse to the bazonkers grand sonnery, he let his mind leak out onto the sketch pad without restraint. But all good things come to an end, and in 2000, an aging Genta decided it was time to sell up, kick back, and get some much needed beach time. Yeah, that lasted all of about five seconds, because also in 2000, Genta founded a new watch brand, Gerald Charles. In 2006, he released the Maestro, a name that had been gifted to him by the industry for being so damn good at designing watches. Too good, in fact. Calling the watch maestro like that is just rubbing it in the industry's face, like fragrantly singing at a man with a hearing aid. But all good things really do come to pass, as Genta did in 2011, and the maestro was no more. Until it was revived in 2020, that is. The watch, I mean, not the man. And in a world of cynical business deals done to capitalise on the names of since-gone legends, I actually think this is a good thing. The Nautilus and Royal Oak are so far beyond the means of ordinary people that Genta fans looking to own a piece of the action are left unstuck. But the Maestro, that's a simple time-only watch in stainless steel with a nice but affordable voucher calibre inside. The same one found in the £4,870 Hermes H08. It's the makings of the perfect fairy tale. The revival of Genta's legacy in a way that re-energises a tired, cynical community. Or it would be if the Maestro weren't £14,200. But wait, there's more. Jump ahead to the Maestro Sport Skelet in matte finished titanium and you'll spy a skeletonized version of the Voucher Micro Rotor Movement found in the £20,000 Parmigiani Tonda. Only from Gerald Charles, it'll cost you £53,500. This is the first watch I saw the price of on the Gerald Charles website and I remember seeing the deposit option of £5,350 and thinking they'd have a little trouble moving them at that price. When I realised that was just the deposit, I damn near ruptured my spleen. Okay, okay, so let's be measured about this. It's not the standard Voucher Micro Rotor, it's been skeletonized. But look closer and you'll see this work is done entirely by machine, with rounded inner angles and CNC marks on all the bevels. And it's at this proximity you'll also realize that much of the complexity in the skeletonization isn't even in the movement. It's done to a plate laid on top of the movement. See how the jewels and screws peer up from their hidey holes like little Timmy's stuck down a well. The conversation always goes something like this. Have you heard of Baum? Baum et Mercier? No, Baum. Are you having a stroke? That's exactly what I just said. And such a response is as warranted now as it was back in 2018 when Baum, not Baum et Mercier, was announced. The perpetually cautious will immediately be thinking the same thing. How did Baum not get sued into the next dimension? Ah, that's because the company that owns Baum et Mercier created Baum. Do you see? But wait, they're different companies then. I don't know what you're not getting about this. Baum et Mercier is a watch brand. Got it? Baum is a different watch brand owned and created by the same company. Simple. This was very clearly emphasised at launch that the two brands were entirely separate, with no overlap or crossover or any other synonym to suggest otherwise. So if that's what Baum isn't, what about what it is? Well, I'm glad you asked, because Baum is a hip new brand focused on customization and sustainability, bringing watchmaking to a younger, cooler audience. Featuring trendy recycled materials and a quartz movement from the other side of the planet, the Baum brand launched with two collections, the optimistically titled Iconic series and the F*** it, it's Friday, let's go home custom timepiece series. Yes, the custom timepiece in Baum's collection is called Custom Timepiece. This level of blue sky, outside the box brain sharting came hand in hand with the 
most how do you do fellow kids marketing campaign since that school assembly on wearing seatbelts. After crunching the data, deliberating the board meetings and focusing the groups, the people at Balm decided the best way to appeal to the hearts and minds of a younger generation with £500 to blow on a watch was... <sighs> skateboarding. Yes, like a badly informed politician looking to assuage a youthful demographic, they chose cringe, and I don't think you'll be surprised to learn it didn't work. And so in 2020, it was announced that Bohm would become part of Bohm et Mercier after all, in the biggest retreat since Dunkirk. I want to take this moment to highlight what I think is the biggest problem with the legacy watch brands and groups today. Dissociation. Why do I say this? Because Baum was quoted to have been targeted at millennials, who, in 2018, were as old as 37. Time to get some new blood, folks. Right, so when it comes to associations with World War II, there are some grey areas. Panerai made watches for the Italian Navy, an Axis power. IWC made watches for the German Air Force, again, an Axis power. They both still make those watches, and we, as a community, have decided that the object itself has enough separation from the actions of those who wore them to dissociate the two. Without that, we wouldn't be able to enjoy things like the fantastic 9-11. Where I think we stray too close to the line is with a certain watch brand based on plans for a submarine instrument that was revived following the success of Panerai to create a new business opportunity. To be clear, all that so far is fine with me, as are the Luminor and Big Pilot, which, and this really tickles me, IWC refers to as being built in response to demand. They're pieces of historic technology that can be appreciated in isolation, and in the case of IWC, went on to benefit the British Royal Air Force as soon as the war was over. But here's the issue I have. If you were to take the Panerai and call it the Ship Destroyer, or the Big Pilot and call it the City Bomber, it might be a little too much. That didn't seem to stop U-Boat, who simply decided to name their brand after one of the Nazis' most successful war machines in the entire conflict. Read the room, guys. The next one is aimed less at one particular brand, although I shall name a few, and more at a group that, in my eyes, takes advantage of the free market a little too much for my liking. Yes, we're all adults and we should do our own research and be responsible for our own actions, but sometimes you just want to buy something nice without having to be cynical about it. And so when you're looking for a nice, simple, affordable watch and come across the sleek, shiny websites of the likes of Daniel Wellington or Movement, you feel safe just to go ahead and enjoy the purchase rather than sweat bullets over it. Let me tell you something. In my life so far, I've been robbed, beaten, received death threats, run over by a car, knocked off my bike, and temporarily paralysed, and all by the same person. But none of those things, none of them, come close to the horror of realising I've been conned. This is the weirdest thing ever, but of all those things that have happened to me, it's buying something I thought was great and realising it was some piece of dog shit later on that pops into my head just when I'm about to fall asleep. This group of brands I'm talking about are the ones that sell you a £20 AliExpress watch for £200 on the promise of slick advertising and a video of some tan 20-somethings having fun in Daddy's Beach House. Maybe I'm alone in this, but the contrast of naive hope and excitement against the sickening realisation of being taken for a ride makes me feel smaller than a quark at a proton party. Maybe I just have a crippling fear of failure that's exacerbated by the bearing money has on success. I'm not a psychologist. Even picturing the scene makes me feel icky. You've got a raise, you're doing well, it's your birthday, you get a watch, which you really like, and then you find out it's a rebadged AliExpress job for 10 times the price, and now you either have to ditch it and upset all involved, or keep that secret to your last dying breath. You're not wearing your watch anymore, honey. Ugh, oh, I could just hear it now. Ugh. There are more legends in this feature than an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, only this next one still telling his story. He's done more for the watch industry than Thomas Midgley Jr. did for the progression of transport, just minus the millions of deaths and irreparable damage to the environment. I'm talking about Jean-Claude Beaver. He's got quite the list of achievements to his name. Omega, as we know it today, the third largest watch brand in the world, exists as it does because of this man. It would have otherwise languished into nothingness. Daniel Craig isn't allowed to enjoy a Rolex because of this man. Then there's Blancpain, which he revived and is now the, um, greatest, um, okay, so that one doesn't really work. But Hublot, he took the reins of Hublot to turn it into, um, the biggest, something 
Okay, so that's a little bit reductive. Beaver's work with Blancpain in the 1980s turned the tide on quartz, reviving the idea that a mechanical watch could be a beautiful, emotive thing. It was an uphill battle, with Beaver dubbed by the press as a nostalgia salesman. And not just any press, but the Swiss press. I've got a feeling that sentiment's going to bite them on the arse. 50 million in sales soon changed their tune and caught the attention of the Swatch Group too, who not only bought Blancpain from Beaver, but kindly asked him if he might do the same for Dead Duck Omega. See, Omega had put every last egg in a basket made of quartz, and funnily enough, people didn't want to pay big money for quartz watches, and so Omega went uh-oh, and that's when Jean-Claude Beaver stepped in. He recruited a crack team of watch marketing hotshots that would go on to become brand CEOs in their own right, including Rolexes, and together they tripled Omega's revenue. Then Beaver got really sick, and then he came back with a bang that was big for Hublot, with the Hublot Big Bang watch. Say what you want about Hublot and the Big Bang, it is still the 12th biggest watch brand in the entire world. Beaver could sell methane to a moo cow, and proving his point with Hublot like that is just rubbing it in the industry's face, like flagrantly looking at a man with a guide dog. All he touches turns to gold. Even he has remarked on his good business fortune, describing himself as a cat that always lands on all four paws, even when chucked out of a window upside down. And so, as all the greats are wont to do, when it came to releasing a watch under his own name, the world waited with bated breath, only to find themselves face to face with what can only be described as a half million dollar AliExpress watch. The craftsmanship, I'm sure, is wondrous. The complication with the tourbillon and minute repeater is world class, and the finish, which will be even further improved into the production versions, is absolutely astonishing. Shame it looks like an Invicta. To be fair to Beaver, the guy is such a good sport. He's taken all this and more on the chin with a smile. And if I were him, I would be smiling too, because he's sold enough of these to keep his cheese farm going until the rapture. I may not like it, but once again he's proven that what I think really doesn't matter one jot. The last worst brand is also the best brand, and for reasons that I hope will soon become clearer than simply my mind having been lost to the ether. I'll cut to the chase. I'm talking about Rolex, and it is for me the epitome of worseness out of all of these brands. Let me explain why. I've owned now three Rolex watches. Some I really liked, some I liked a little less than others, but there's one constant throughout. They were all fantastic watches with a balance of everything that makes a singular watch great. They aren't the best at anything. There are better, more prestigious brands. There are watches with finer craftsmanship. There's better value to be had elsewhere. But actually, put all those things together and you'll struggle to find a better balance than Rolex. Brand, for example, goes without saying. People will pay more than Rolex wants for one, and that's all you need to know. It's the byproduct of many great decisions made over Rolex's lifetime, and frankly makes its competition look like amateurs. Quality? No, they're not hand beveling and polishing and striping and all that good stuff, but there's still a certain heft and shine to a Rolex that feels a bit… extra. Whether it's the gleam of the metal or just the crown logo on the dial, I can't be sure. But it's hard to say they don't feel luxurious, despite the simplicity. And value. You might brand me crazy for calling a Rolex good value, but you take a look at the prices others like Omega, Breitling and Cartier are charging now, and all of a sudden a 36mm OP, especially with those residuals, feels like a decision you can make as much with your head as you can with your heart. This all very much sounds like I adore Rolex. And... I do. Even the business side. The move to CPO is genius and will help stem the spikiness we've seen lately. The purchasing of Bukera to streamline the customer experience is peerless and should stem the tide on shady dealer practices. And the expansion of its manufacturing will hopefully shrink waitlists to a more reasonable duration. So why is it the worst? Because when I first bought a Rolex, I got to do so on my own terms. I was a customer, with money, who wanted to feel special. And I did. Buying a Rolex was, without doubt, a very rewarding experience. But now, it's different. The watches are fantastic still, sublime even, but the experience makes me feel like a little orphan boy begging for more. I really don't like my enjoyment being at the behest of some bloke in a shiny suit who can barely even spell Rolex. I'm not saying I want red carpets and glasses of champagne and performing circus lions. I just want to leave the transaction feeling like I supported them and not the other way round. That makes Rolex bad, 
But what makes it the worst is that even the idea of receiving a Rolex on bended knee is still a hypothetical. To even get to that point, there's a whole load of servitude that comes before it. Like, I'm not looking to get knighted here, I just want to buy a nice watch like I used to be able to. Is that so much to ask? Those are my worst watch brands, what are yours? Let me know down in the comments. A big thanks goes out to my Patreons for supporting me and to all of you for watching as well. And remember, if there's a job you want but you don't have the qualifications, just make it up. Who's going to check? Goodbye.